For those of you that um, got the notes, we, there was a chart that was handed out. For those of you that might have it, I made sure I put on the bottom of that. If it's not mine, I'll, I don't like to plagiarize on purpose. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but I put it down there. I wanted to hand it to you. I was going to put it up here, but I thought it might be something you might want to look at in detail. I'm not going over this today. But I just thought it might be good for you to have. Um, because when we think about the purpose of the church, a lot of times, what is that purpose? And we get tied up on that, trying to, because everybody has a different realization or idea what the church's purpose is. And then we have what Christ says the purpose of the church is. And this really does a good job of explaining the differences, and so I wanted to have you, have, have you get this so you could refer to it at a later time. We're going to be reading, continue our um, uh, study in the book of Acts. We're going to look at chapter 6 this morning, verses 1 through 7, so if you want to find that text of Scripture in your Bible or on your phone or iPad or whatever you use to look up Scripture, you do that this morning and I'll read it along and we'll look at it together. Chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, it says, But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. I find that hard to believe. (laughs) That right there, we might as well just quit. That's not true, is it? The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Now, some people would take harsh words against that, but we'll explain what that means. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom and We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles could spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea. Wow. Think about that. I would agree that the rumblings continued. But everyone liked this idea. That there in itself. Let's put that down for another miracle in the book of Acts. It also says in one of the books of Acts, they all met in one accord. That, uh, that's a big thing, too. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Steve, and the man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parnas, Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. And these seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests, notice that, and many of the Jewish priests, the religious of the day, were converted also. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Some observations up to this point, I think these are in your notes, I think I left them in there. Up to this point, we've studied a lot, and I found all these, and I thought I would just end every word at the end of these observations with a word that ends with L-Y, just so it would rhyme a little bit. But these are some things we've already discovered just this far into the book of Acts. There are many more, but I wanted to stop at this many. It said, the Spirit was working mightily. The Word was preached powerfully. God was worshipped devoutly. The people were giving generously. Material possessions were given sacrificially. Needs were being met miraculously. Miracles were observed frequently. The religious were mad constantly. The apostles were opposed regularly. And in spite of all of this, the church was growing rapidly. So some people say, well, this pandemic, these last two years, it's done nothing but kill the church. Well, 
While I do know church numbers are going down, I can say that there's a lot of people now viewing church services via Zoom, Facebook Live, some type of venue that before the pandemic they weren't even tuning in. The only problem I have with those types of genre of people watching services is for those that have left the church just because it's easier to put their jammies on and watch from the couch. I think if we are called family of God, we should be here encouraging each other and not neglecting the assembling of ourselves with one another. But for those that cannot get out, for those that have no church home and want to hear the word of God, it is a great venue to reach out. I've talked to pastors where they have had just as many or more people watching via Zoom or whatever, Facebook Live, than they actually have sitting in the seats of their church. So we see all this stuff going on here, and I guess in modern day vernacular, we'd say we've had a lot of stuff going on in America the last couple of years, and we look around and I see new faces here today that I have maybe haven't seen in the last six months, and I see new people coming in and staying, and that blesses my heart. And I hope that the continuation through my ministry here at Harvest Point, that we continue to see new people coming in. The church should grow rapidly through turbulent times. That's when in historic, if you, if you go back in history, historically the church has always grown faster through tribulation. But we have some purposes here that we have to follow, and there are some reasons why that happens. We're going to look at effective church ministry, so you can, effective church ministry, then we're going to continue that sentence through these points. The first thing I want you to understand is effective church ministry is always contingent upon obedience to the Lord. If we go to the previous chapter, just the last couple of verses, as these apostles were being opposed, it says in verse 41 of the previous chapter, in chapter 5, it says, The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer suffer disgrace. Well, what did they suffer? Well, in verse 40, it says that they were flogged, and jailed, but we see in verse 42 that, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they what? Continued to teach and preach this message that Jesus is the Messiah. There are some people today that do not have the intestinal fortitude or conviction to do the word of God if some type of government authority or state authority or even family authority or church authority would say, you better not do that. If the Word of God says to do that, then by all means do that. People say, well, that's not respecting government. Well, you have to understand what Scripture says. Scripture doesn't tell you to respect the government and to obey the government if they violate the word of God. So what we had going on through the pandemic is was there a lot of people using that pandemic to shut down things that probably should have never been shut down for a long period of time. I'm all for watching one's P's and Q's when it comes to our health. And I myself, when I was pastoring, I did the same thing. But folks were on our way out, and I'm glad for that. There's a time where we need to be obedient and come back. And it's always contingent upon us doing what the Lord wants us to do. Because sometimes when we're going through opposition, we forget that the Lord is still there. And He wants us to obey Him regardless of whether we're liking or disliking life at the moment. 
Effective church ministry, number two, is always in response to a need that needs met. Look in verse one. But there were some believers that were discontent. There was a need that needed met. What was that need? To give you some history on this, as the church grew, it began to encounter the problems of that institutions suffer from, that they face as the church grows. I mean, no nation probably ever felt this greater sense of responsibility for the less fortunate in their community and probably the Jews. They had rules governing how they should take care of themselves. And so in the synagogue, there was a routine custom, and two collectors went around the market and to private houses every Friday morning. And they made a collection for the needy, partly in money and partly in goods. And later in that day, this was distributed. Those who, there were two types of people, those who were temporary in need, or temporarily in need received enough just to have them carry on. But those who were permanently unable to support themselves received enough for 14 meals. So that would be two meals a day for what? One week. And so this fund from which this distribution was made was either called the Koopa or the basket. And in addition to this house, the house collection was made daily. There was also called the tumai or the tray. And they would go around and they would collect for that as well. It is clear that the Christian church had taken over this custom by now. They had taken over this. But amidst the Jews themselves, there was a conundrum that followed. In the Christian church, there were two kinds of Jews attending. There were the Jerusalem or the Palestinian Jews who spoke Aramaic, the descendant of the ancestral language, and, and prided themselves for not having any foreign blood in them. There was no foreign mixture. They were purebreds. They weren't mongrels like those Gentiles. There were also Jews from foreign countries who had come and received Christ and were part of the church, but yet the Jews, this is amazing, you have a family of God with different people and some people just couldn't get along with others. I can't imagine that. <laughs> so you have those Jews that come from a Gentile persuasion, and then you, the Greek-speaking Jews and those that were purebreds, you know, they were born into Judaism. They were all saved. They all had the same what? Lord. But for some reason, whether it was true or not, the story was spread that, hey, the Greek-speaking Jews weren't getting their rightful distribution of food. It was all going to those purebreds over there. And so the elders were contacted. The chair of the board was contacted. And so we've got to do something about this. Well, the problem was that at that time they had no elder board, so they went right to the apostles. Now, the apostles, if you read up to this point, they were busy about preaching and doing the, the, the ministry of of trying to win souls for Christ, trying to distribute the word properly so others could follow in Christ's footsteps. But this, um, this didn't go well. The, the apostles said, we don't have time to do both. Go figure. The joke is, I have a lot of time because I only work one day a week. That's the joke. and I understand that's the joke. And I accept it like that. I've always, I've always stated that, you know, I've got the best job in the world. I work one day a week and only two hours of that day. The rest of the time I just sit back and do nothing, you know. And um, I would ask you to come to my house for a week and see how much I'm gone in a week. And you'll probably understand that that's not true. But that's okay. But these people were busy. These apostles were busy. Now, some people will say, 
Yeah, but if they were only working one day a week, they should have had time to solve this problem. Why did they cop an attitude and say, well, hey, we can't do this. We, we can't do this. We don't run a food program. Well, really, the, I, the question has to be answered. Is it more important that these apostles feed people spiritually or physically? Now, there's a bad situation there. Well, if you don't feed them physically, they won't listen to you spiritually. Well, the, the pastor wants to look beyond that and say, I believe both can get done. But it's going to require the help of the church. There you go. Now the apostles can do what they're gifted at doing, preaching the word, and the people can do what they're called to do, help the people in the church and community. Amen? Amen. All right, so that's what, we, that's what we got going on here. So now you kind of understand what this rumbling was about. It was a legitimate concern. Apparently there was some basis of fact to this request because they acted on it. If it would have been a lie, I'm sure um, we would have been told that or it would have been addressed in some way because we've seen what happened later on when a lie was told and two people fell dead the same day. I do think there was some um, reason for them to get upset here. So these seven godly men were chosen to straighten out this situation. I guess that could be called the first elder board, the first deacon board, whatever you want to call them. But it was the first board I can find in the church. It's extremely interesting to note that the first office bearers to be appointed were chosen not to talk, but just for service. And if you're what is that statement I've said to you before? If you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. And they were willing to do this. A Stephen, the first one, a man full of the Spirit, that later died as a martyr, was willing to take this job as a server. And guess what? Later on he preached a sermon that cost him his life. But it began, his ministry began by serving the church. So effective church ministry is always in response to a need that needs met. Effective church ministry, number three, is always in tandem with the Great Commission, not in place of. Understand that. Remember what I just said about, well, are you to preach the message? Or are you to run a food program? What's my answer? Both. And that's what they proved here. They weren't, as we would put it, copying an attitude. They were asking a question. Do you want us to be out there helping people find Jesus Christ and filling their souls with spiritual food? Or do you want us to quit doing that and feed them physically while we see their souls go to hell. And they challenged the people and said, we can do both. And the church benefited from it, and we are still talking about the story today. I think sometimes what happens is churches, the larger they get, the more internalized they get. It becomes about, the church becomes a place where you take care of the needs of the church and we lose the focus of meeting the needs of the lost outside the church. I already gave you those statistics about the 91% of the people polled thought the need, the, the, the reason for church was to take care of the needs of those inside. Only 9% of those polled felt it was to win the loss for Jesus Christ. I guess the statement goes, are we truly then fishers of men that want to win other people to Christ, or we just like to keep the fishbowl clean? Really, that's what it comes down to. And I, when I look around and I see what I see going on in Harvest Point, it thrills me to see um, people that are wanting to do this. 
I get questioned all the time. Pastor, we would like to be involved in this. I would like to do this. Do you mind, Pastor, if we would maybe start this or start that? Or could we look into doing this? This is what we're about. That blesses my heart. There was a need that needed met. And it was in tandem with the great mission. Yeah, we're to go out and make disciples of all nations. We're to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, of the Holy Spirit. We're to teach them to obey everything that we've commanded. And we're to reminded by Christ that he'll be with us till the end of the earth. We believe that, but we are also told to go visit those in prison and to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked. It's not an either or, it's a both. You don't sacrifice the gospel for just meeting a need because the greatest need is that somebody hear the gospel. So effective church ministry is in tandem with the Great Commission, not in place of. The next thing, effective church ministry is permissible and sometimes even preferable outside the apostolic role. There are doors that you can go through as non-clergy that I can't. Most people think that my position gives me privilege in the eyes of outsiders. It perhaps used to do that, and I've seen the change. I've seen pastors when I was a child in the 70s, and they would rock into the local restaurant or go pull into the gas station or go into a hotel or something like this, and people knew them, and they would almost curtsy these people. <laughs> Things have changed greatly. People act seldom act different around me than they act, about, act around anybody else. In fact, when they find out I'm a minister, sometimes they'll see just what they can get away with before I say something. It doesn't bother me in so much that if they understood that they're not offending me, but they're offending God. I'm okay with it. I'm called to be a pastor. I didn't plan on it, didn't train for it, but that's what God's called me to be. I don't have a problem with people making fun of me, but it really burdens me when they don't understand. They're not really offending me, they're offending Christ. That's going to cost them greatly. I'm not going to harm them at all. I'm a pretty easy to get along person. But at the last day, when every knee will bow, I hope, our hope is that we have made that choice for Jesus. That we are allowed into his pearly gates rather than where those that don't know him go. But there are qualifications for leadership. We see three qualifications here. We see they had to be well-respected. In other words, they couldn't be the town drunk, the temple prostitute, the known gossip in town, and you can fill in the blanks there. They had to be well-respected people. They had to be full of the Spirit. Remember we talked about that earlier in chapter 2, the filling of the Spirit. They had to be those that contained more strength than just within themselves. They had to have the Spirit of God controlling them. And they had to have some intelligence, some teaching. We have qualifications here for leadership in a church. And when... One of the qualifications of leadership, if you're a key leader in a church, you have to at least be a voting, a voting member. Now, and I keep saying that voting member because in a church of God, we do not believe in formal membership. It says in Scripture, to all those who were being saved, they became part of the church. We believe if you've given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, you are a part, a quote, member of the church of God, thus you're a part of this family called Harvest Point. We believe that. But if you want voting privileges, and you would like to make a voting rights in the church, you have to sign a piece of paper saying that 
a, a few qualifications. That you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. First and foremost, you have to do that. We all have qualifications to something. We have to have them. You know, you have to give to the church. You, you have to attend this church. And you have to do it for a period of time. You can't just come one Sunday and say, I want to be a, a voter and then leave. No, you have to show six months of attending here. You have to give financially to this church and call this your church home and give your heart to Jesus Christ. Every position has qualifications. This was no different. They had to be well-respected, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom. I would ask if you would want to be a, a leader in this church, that these steps can be taken. There's, a, there's ways that this can be done. But first and foremost, if you want to be a leader in the church, first of all, are you willing to be a servant of it? That's all. And I think it's interesting to note sometimes when people want to become leaders of church and then you ask them for these qualifications, then you find an attitude emerging. Well, who are you to judge? I've been a Christian all my life. Well, we're not, ask, we're not denouncing that. We're just asking you to say that. That's all. And it, it irritates me sometimes where people will get upset at that because I find it respectable that a church would require their people to know Jesus Christ before they would be a leader in the church of God. <laughs> would only be normal. Understand your character shines brightly when that stuff like that happens. More is caught than taught. You can catch things from people when you require them be qualified or answer important questions. So these men met, those seven men met those qualifications. The next thing for effective church ministry, it's only possible when godly people are obedient to God and willing to serve. In verse 5 and 6, so these seven men were presented to the apostles. They were willing. They said, yes, we want to do this. I would imagine if, we, if they would have had them seven men and they would have met those qualifications and they would have all said, no, nah, we don't want to do that. We would rather be apostles. That's what we want to do. We feel a call to preach. Well, man, I'll tell you, when I, um, long before I even knew how to almost spell sermon, I was serving the... <laughs> church in some capacity. I think it was my first paid job where I actually had to pay income tax on my money. I used to mow grass, deliver newspapers, stuff like that. But I'm talking, I remember going before, the, at that time it was the Board of Trustees in Newton Falls, and they needed somebody to mow grass. I think I was the ripe old age of about 12 or 13. And I had seven yards to mow. I had to mow three parsonages, and I had to mow the churchyard. Then I had three other yards outside the church I did. But they hired me to mow four yards. I had to keep the yards mowed, trimmed, edged, all that. And in the winter, I'd do all their sidewalks and driveways. And I'd done that till I was in my 20s, believe it or not. The only time they gave me off was when I went to college. I took a few years off there. Who would have thought I'd still be employed by the church at 57 years old? But no, I didn't know that. I did not know that, what the Lord had in store for me. But I learned something. When I got that job, I remember I wasn't even saved when I got that job. I got saved when I was 14. Took a job at the church mowing grass. Wasn't saved, but I surely did know that I should have been. So... Um, and I knew that it was right to give to the coffers of the church, to give of my tithe. So I went to Sister Lily because I see her all the time when she was living, I mowed her grass. 
And I went over and knocked on her door. And I asked her, I said, Sister Lily, can you uh, by chance give me some tithing envelopes so I can start tithing? I remember that day. It began a trek of obedience. Simple obedience as you grow in the faith. I wasn't even a member of God's church at that time. But I felt I needed to give to the church that loved me and supported me and at that time was supporting me financially. Got to start a new savings account. But that's the way our life with Christ proceeds when we obey the callings of Jesus Christ. Step by step. Don't expect to go from basically the pew to the pulpit with one giant leap. I have found out it's steps to get there. If God has called you to it, then you'll get there. But just be patient and more important, obedient. In verse 7, the last point, that's always the best one. Amen? There you go, verse 7. So God's message continued to spread and the number of believers greatly increased. I believe effective church ministry is the impetus for further church growth. When the church is meeting the needs of the community it's in and it serves, the church will grow. It will. That's the, that's the best point of the whole thing here. Sometimes you do things because they're just right to do, and other times you do things, there's a strategy to have people come and be a part of us. But regardless, if we're obedient to what the Lord has called us to do, we're willing to serve and meet a need. Guess what? We will reap a harvest from the seed that we have sown for the cause of Jesus Christ. Points to ponder as we leave. If a church's ministry is to be effective, it must be done out of obedience to the Lord. If a church's ministry is to be effective, it must meet a need. If a church's ministry is to be effective, the Great Commission must not be abandoned. And there are a lot of churches today that would rather preach a message of cultural relevance than that of Christ-centered truth. I can turn the TV on and tell you a couple of them, but I might make a few of you mad. The next thing, if a church's ministry is to be effective... Everybody must do what the Lord has called them to do, no matter how big or small, because in my opinion, there is no big or small task in the kingdom of God. They're all necessary and all important. I can think back in my ministry from the time I started over in Ravenna and then went to Corland. People that like those positions of servanthood in the church, the behind the scenes, you never saw them. But man, I was calling their house or knocking on their door a lot of times because I depended on those people. The church never knew what they did and they wanted me to keep it that way. If I would have made their name public, they would have probably quit. But they just wanted to serve and be obedient. Everybody must do what the Lord has called them to do. And lastly, if a church's ministry is effective, growth will be the result. That's what we want, amen? amen? And I think the Lord is already showing us signs of the like.